Hello, my name is Stephen Bulger, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion about Arthur Tress's photographs on the occasion of our exhibition at the gallery entitled The Tip of an Iceberg. I first became familiar with Arthur's work while in first year at uh, university studying photography. In a critique session, one of our instructors was describing someone's work as having a dream-like sensibility, and it was a catchphrase that we all thought was interesting and thinking it made us a bit smarter sounding that we tried to incorporate that phrase into a lot of our presentations until the teacher put a stop to it, saying, for those of you who are not familiar with Arthur Tress's work, please do not use that expression. I was curious, so I went to the library the day after the critique and took out his book called Dreamcatcher, and I've been a fan ever since. So I'm pleased to be here with you to listen in on this discussion that Arthur will have with Paul Roth, who's the director of the Image Center at Toronto Metropolitan University, my alma mater. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, with Arthur Tress. Uh, I am Paul Roth. I'm the director of the Image Center uh, in uh, Toronto at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. And uh, it's a special pleasure for me to, uh, to take part in this uh, conversation with uh, one of my longtime favorite photographers. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm just so happy that it's in the context of uh, what I understand is the very first exhibition of Arthur's work um, here in Canada, uh, which is called Tip, The Tip of an Iceberg and, uh, and is on view at Stephen Bulger Gallery uh, in Toronto. Um, because it's Arthur's first uh, exhibition in Canada, I want to introduce him a bit. Um, he is uh, presently, I believe, in, uh, 82 years old. He's been working as a photographer since the early 1960s, and he continues to photograph uh, almost every day. Uh, he's very active, exhibiting and publishing. In fact, he's working right now with Jim Gans, the head of the Department of Photographs at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles on a major exhibition which will open in LA in 2024. Uh, and that exhibition will perhaps be the capstone on a very long uh, productive career exhibiting internationally. Uh, and uh, while Arthur has shown all over the world, his work has also been collected by institutions all over the world. Uh, among them are uh, such august uh, museums as the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which is uh, kind of Arthur's local museum. Uh, Arthur lives and works in the Bay Area um, and in New York City, the Whitney Museum and the Metropolitan Museum in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the National Gallery of Art, uh, and uh, um, also museums around the world, Centre Pompidou in Paris and many, many others, far too many to list. Um, but me, uh, my first discovery of Arthur's work was actually uh, just over 20 years ago when I uh, found myself in the position of being uh, the assistant on uh, his, um, his last retrospective show, which was called Fantastic Voyage, and which was um, organized as a traveling show and for the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, where I was at that time, the assistant curator of photographs. Uh, the show opened in 2001. It was organized by uh, Richard Lawrence, a photography and curator, a uh, curator and writer uh, who was based in the Bay Area, and also uh, Philip Brookman, who was the photography curator at the Corcoran at that time. Uh, this was, I believe, Arthur's second major traveling show after a mid-career survey called Talisman, which traveled throughout Europe from the late 1980s into the early 1990s. Even though Arthur's career was already a rich one, um, when I first saw those pictures uh, in uh, roughly speaking 2000, as we were getting ready for the show, it was my first experience seeing his work in person. I had seen one or two of his books before that, um, but seeing them with my own eyes uh, and all together, all these different bodies of work spanning his career was a real revelation. And it opened my mind not only to Arthur's work, but also to a whole range of work that was being done by his contemporaries in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which I didn't really fully understand in context until I saw Arthur's work. I'm referring here to people like Dwayne Michaels, uh, Marsha Resnick, Les Crims, Laurie Simmons, Cindy Sherman, a whole range of people operating in entirely different traditions and contexts, but all making work uh, that was that had in common a kind of mysterious theatrical 
quality that was staged fictional work, um, expressive of dream logic, nightmare scenarios, childhood fears, buried traumas, and on and on. And I had never really quite put it all together until I saw Arthur's work. So for me, it was a bit of an anchor to a whole set of traditions in photo history. And I think about his work to this day because of that. Um, and it was fascinating to me, the distinction between their work, which uh, means that in effect, by looking at Arthur's work, I started to understand Cindy Sherman's work better. So I do want to make that point. I think that was a very powerful thing for me in my career. All those years um, later, so we're now 20 something years later, um, Arthur's work remains especially compelling to me among that cohort because uh, there are so many things I admire about it. And I was reminded of that in Stephen's show. Uh, there's a surrealist and whimsical approach and an evocation of a visual dream logic that I think of as quite unique in photography. He had had and has a boundless creativity, a spirit of invention, which means that Arthur's style has always changed from one body of work to the next throughout his career. And each body of work is really quite distinct one from the next. And finally, his work stays with me because his photographs are so innovative in narrative terms. Uh, Arthur sketches out entire stories across a purposeful sequence. And he also can tell incredibly complex stories within a single image. And I don't know any photographer who is so agile in narrative terms. The exhibition at Stevens Gallery includes um, examples from many of Arthur's most important bodies of work. Um, it has a representation of pictures from his early open space series, uh, where Arthur finds moments of strangeness in the flow of everyday life, uh, simply by seriously addressing and being open to the struggles that people face in their public lives and the presentation of their faces um, outside the doors of their homes. It includes photographs from his seminal projects, Dream Collector, Shadows, and Theater of the Mind, which I think are probably Arthur's best known bodies of work. Uh, all made in the 1970s with so many extraordinary and iconic images that have become part of photo history and represented in photo history books. There's some great pictures from Facing Up, which is Arthur's groundbreaking project about gay male desire and sexuality. And those pictures are forerunners of a lot of work to come by a great number of photographers whose work we know well now. And I was also very happy to see in this exhibition a group of pictures from Arthur's witty, uh, yet also kind of devastating uh, project Fish Tank Sonata, uh, which um, is a set of constructed fantasy scenarios, parables about ecology, staged in color in, in a fish tank, literally in a fish tank. And then the fish tanks with these scenarios are actually placed in the real world. And Arthur makes these amazing um, collapsed space images that are really, really provocative and I think still powerful um, they've stayed with me ever since I first saw them. I think about them every time I think about the history of photographers' understanding of an approach to climate change and the environment. A truly seminal body of work. However, I have to say that for me, the revelation of the show at Bulger Gallery is the newest works in the show, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a spelling project, which I think Arthur is still working on, called Pointers, where he goes out into the world and looks at the world through a rotated axis making diamond shaped images of a variety of subjects, including patterns found in nature, in architecture, uh, in landscapes and on and on. And all of the pictures in this show um, kind of span his career, but they're also just a sampling of this very, very prolific career um, where Arthur has made many bodies of work that you won't see in the show and that you will have yet to discover after uh, after seeing this conversation, and I hope you will. I hope you'll look at his many publications and, and dig more deeply into his work. Um, all of that was a very lengthy way of introducing Arthur. So at this point, I just want to say, um, Arthur, welcome. Um, okay. We're so happy to have your work here in Toronto. Well, I, I think from what I've seen of the show, it, it's, it is an amazing broad body of work that, uh, I've done over the years. And somehow I just keep pushing myself forward. I, I dislike repeating myself. You know, I think it's very easy to fall into a kind of photographic formula yeah. and just 
that become successful and that people, it's what people expect from you. And uh, after my show at the Corcoran, you know, it was an entire museum floor and I was totally overwhelmed. I was age 60. And uh, I said, you know, what do I do for an encore? And so I sort of said, well, why not go back to ground zero? Just like you were that kid in high school with your roll of cord and wandering around the streets of Coney Island and Brighton Beach after, after school and, and just seeing things and being amazed by it and seeing light and shadow that you could put it inside the camera and make prints of it. So I've tried to return to that kind of naive attitude. And so for the last 22 years, I've just been following that path to see where it's taken me. And, uh, and so I've explored some interesting avenues. Uh, I've gone into uh, what you might call sports photography. I've done projects on skate parks and paintball, just trying to expand and learn new things about what you can do with a camera and, and your mind. Uh, but also finding more recently, just in the ordinary, the prosaic kind of profound things in their suchness that they're just there. And what happens as you get to be older, you know, I'm 82, your attitude towards things. And I've noticed that in the work of other older photographers like Weston and Cortez and uh, Harry Callahan, you just tend to let things be. You kind of get a little distance from things. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've, I've done a lot of Buddhist studies where, where the self becomes a little less important. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, one of my last books is called Skate Park. Mm. And as the skaters went by, I'd spin the camera, mm. you know, with their movement. And it, I, that's something I had never done before. Of course, I'm down in the bowl and these skaters are flying. It's dangerous. And I'm not, I'm a 70 year old man, <laughs> but at the same time, it's invigorating. It keeps you young and interested and, and it worked, you know, and mm. uh, you can do that with a computer, you know, kind of rotate, but engaging in accident and mm. chance and incorporating that all into the work now, it's just exciting. You know, it's something to look forward to every day when I go out. Huh. I have to say, uh, you know, it, it fascinates me, though, that in a way you've been engaging in chance right from the beginning, because, yes. you know, so it's kind of consistent with what I think of uh, when I imagine you at the beginning of your career, or at least the beginning of your artistic career. You, you actually have uh, worked as a different kind of photographer, um, you know, prior to uh, Open Space, which is the first yeah. series in the show. But when I was at Steve's gallery and, and remembering open space, which I think was also the introduction of the, of the um, Corcoran uh, retrospective, which by the way, was called, uh, I mentioned it before, there's also this great book. So you can uh, go back and see this book, which Richard and, um, uh, and, um, and Philip worked on and, and you as well, Arthur, I think you actually have a text introducing each body of work in there. Yeah. Um, when I saw open space again, I was really struck by how right from that moment, you can see that you were taking chances with the images that you were making. And the pictures almost seem perched between a kind of documentary vision and a fictional vision. And they're perched between the real and the surreal. And I wonder if you can talk about that, about how you began this mode of dream logic that then permeates yeah. the rest of your career and how you began experimenting in such an unusual way when making a picture out in the world of real people. Well, it is uh, a little complicated, but 
uh, even uh, open space in the inner city was ostensibly had a, a documentary format to show places where you could create parks and recreational spaces along the edge of the city waterfronts and mm. you know, et cetera. But at the same time, when I would go out with the camera, I'd arbitrarily pick a area, say the South Bronx mm. and the East River. I'd sort of, I call them walkabouts, mm. a little bit like the Australian idea of one enters a kind of a dream time, mm. you know, not knowing what's going to happen, but one will find the unexpected mm. and uh, almost being in a kind of a trance-like state. Truly, I mean, when people go out, I just get into a, def a different zone of mind. Mm. And I just think, you know, I just become responsive at a kind of higher level. Uh, a big part of my approach though, uh, especially when I got into the more elaborate uh, portraits of theater of the mind is uh, improvisation. I don't mm. really kind of plan overly set up what I'm gonna photograph. If I'd come into someone's apartment or home, I just use the props and things that they had at hand. Mm. And I would just intuit, intuit kind of psychodramas about them, which, uh, which are in a way also mirrors of my own kind of inner confusions and anxieties. Right. And I don't censor them out. Mm. Uh, and so they become very, somehow very effective cross-pollinated images mm. between the person, my own feelings, my own craziness, and my own daring, mm. you know, to, to ask some old lady to get into a wheelbarrow or the <laughs> father to put his right. daughter's head on a, the kitchen butcher block. You know, yeah. it was outrageous. And yeah. so people would, uh, I kind of smile, and but people were would go along with it because they would understand that we were kind of heading towards a revelatory drama about themselves. Yeah. I'm fascinated by that. I uh, I remember, you know, when I first saw uh, Dream Collector, Theater of the Mind, Shadow, uh, and Facing Up. One of the things that really struck me was the the kind of fantastical scenarios and uh and i then i i think i still feel this way when i look at the pictures even today i wonder how they came into being i wonder where the idea came from sometimes because the idea is pretty out there sometimes that yeah. you, you know i think how how could you even put together this idea of this person wearing those clothes in that space yeah. and um and I think that, you know, I think it's important for people to know who haven't seen this work or, or maybe haven't seen that much of it, is that these series are directly uh, evocative of a dream logic. You know, Dream Collector um, is, in fact, the dream lives of children. Uh, theater of the Mind is the dream lives of adults. Um, shadow is almost like your id <laughs> on display because you're actually acting out scenarios and parts and placing yourself into unusual positions and places. Um, and I don't know if you remember, Arthur, but some 20 years ago, I asked you, how did you get people to do these things? And, and how did you come up with these theatrical yeah. scenarios? And, and you've just kind of hinted at that. So I'm going to ask... <laughs> A little more like how did you actually get them to do it it's so amazing to me uh, well again uh, usually the people that i do photograph know my work okay so, yeah yes or i bring them a book or show them some images so they're already willing to play the game right in a sense <laughs> and um you know, I, I originally in 19, I'd made two or three underground films mm. in the 60s. And so my 
my, I always really wanted to be a film director, cinema mm. person. And so you, you develop certain techniques of moving people around and, and they find them doing things that they wouldn't probably normally agree to. I'm very gentle about it. You know, I say, oh, you know, if you don't want to do it, now don't worry. And, um, uh, and so it just evolves. I think uh, it's, it's, I'm almost a people whisperer. You, I do it with, I don't know, I just do it by my, uh, and I'm a bit aggressive too. I'm normally like this sweet smiling guy. <laughs> I get that camera in here, I become a little uh, frightening in some way. And, and sorry to say that. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's great for people to hear this. And, and uh, just off the cuff, I have to say that I still, when I'm talking uh, to people professionally about what I do in my life, I very often use you to this day as an example as a, of a photographer who expertly could get me to do what you wanted. <laughs> uh, and with great joy, I would always be very happy um, at, how, uh -huh. at how you would, um, because you, you had a way of, of simply making a thing happen. And, and whoever works with you becomes part of that. And it's yes. also very joyful at the same time. And of course, you know, when I did The Dream Collector, uh, children are natural actors. They kind of mm. just easily jump into that world of fantasy. And, mm. and I could say, oh, I'm doing dream photographs. I wouldn't even have to say it. Like, I could just say, you know, would, would you mind hanging upside down from this tree <laughs> or right. you know, climbing up on this baseball stop like your fly? They understood, you know, because that's where their minds are quite a bit. Right. And I always say I, I still have the mind of, a, you know, a 12-year-old kid, you know, reading mad comic books, you know, things right. like that. It's very much an, a part of my life that I try to stay into. Right. Yeah. I, I want to show you something that just just thought of. Okay. Is... Uh, I've kept an el elaborate series of notebooks mm. since the 60s and the, uh, where uh, each, I make the covers out of some artwork that I've kind of stimulated, but um, it, I write down my ideas. Mm. Okay. And the same thing with Dream Collector. I wrote down in my notebooks, I had hundreds of ideas written down. I call them PIs, picture ideas. And- um, What uh, scenarios you're imagining. Yes, but I, I do it with, you know, even my most recent work, these, uh, how just, uh, I'm, I'm doing a new series called the Wonderland Swim Club, uh, where I swim in a big outdoor pool. And I do little surrealist still lives mm. of what people forget at the lost and found department, all the <laughs> goggles and fins right. and towels. And they allow me to take it out into the pool area and create little sculptures <laughs> like sort of Picasso. And yeah. it amuses the lifeguards. But I'm just saying it, it's all kind of written out and then, and then it, I find it in the world somehow brings mm. back either I project it or it's like a gift in a way. Yeah. But yeah. It's sort of that combination, whereas uh, Dwayne Michaels, he really pre determines his scenarios beforehand. I see. But I just, I, as I say, mine is more kind of accidental free flowing based in a documentary approach but kind of pushed over the edge into a kind of a different world. Okay, yeah. That, and, and then the idea is the spur to an improvisation on yeah. the idea, yeah. Um, well, you know, what, there's another element about your work that I, that I do wanna bring up, which is a kind of um, what, what today people might think of as a personal politics of empathy that's expressed through many of your photographs, um, many of your bodies of work. And, and you can see it throughout this exhibition from the, the urban critique that's kind of contained in open space in the inner city 
um, obviously the ecological imperatives of fish tank sonata. Uh, but as people go further into your work, they, they look, for example, at Requiem for a Paperweight, which is not in this show, but a great, great body of work um, following uh, fish tank sonata about the, um, the plight of the, of the, work, of the working man um, kind of caught in a corporate system. Uh, I feel like it's one of the things that I've always loved about your work is that while it is um, whimsical, very often amusing um, uh, and lighthearted, uh, there is a kind of, um, of a very serious conversation going on in many of your projects. And I think of it as a, a very humane um, conversation. Teapot Opera is a good example of that. Um, but sometimes it looks, especially today, it looks like a politics. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. You have, of course, a background as a documentarian. You worked for Vista. Um, uh, you made images all over the world um, in Africa and Mexico that to today's eyes would be almost considered social documentary images, um, very deeply empathetic pictures. And I wonder if that's part of it, if, if, uh, if social conscience is just naturally infused in everything that you do. Well, um, you know, I'm just one generation removed from uh, the Jewish shetel. And I think very much part of my family's background, you know, parents from the depression. My sister was an early gay activist. Uh, and um, so, uh, my uncle saved many Jewish people from the Holocaust. Uh, so that, that was always part of the Tress family zeitgeist in a way. Mm. And then entering the photography world uh, as a serious full-time photographer in the mid sixties, you know, I could have gone into advertising or fashion, but I, I really felt I, wanted to become more uh, a, what came to be called concerned photographer, someone who dealt with social issues, the human condition. Uh, and uh, actually I, I was able to put my photographs into the uh, stock files of Magnum photos for many really? years. <laughs> uh, I gave uh, lectures at uh, ICP, you know, about what they call social commentary, social satire, mm -hmm. social comment. Uh, and so that was kind of always very much uh, a very deliberate narrative of my work, mm -hmm. you know, that, it, that the photograph could function as having a kind of a social purpose in the world. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Even and even when I try to do pure abstract photography in a certain sense, uh, as I'm doing uh, a new series on Silicon Valley mm -hmm. now, uh, I just want to photograph the the interesting, strange buildings that are. <laughs> it's very surreal, especially during the pandemic. These vast, empty parking lot, but you get involved somehow in land use. Uh, how um, the older industrial parks are being uh, replaced by giant uh, life science, biomed. It's like the new industrial complex, these, mm, yeah. these research facilities. So you, you, even though one would like to be a formal, you know, just doing photographs of formal design, you're involved in a different you're still plunged into a different world. Right? Yeah. Um, when, when thinking about uh, the political valence of your images, I think it's impossible to ignore um, the very pioneering work of facing up. Um, you know, to, to my knowledge, you've done two bodies of work at two separate periods in your career about um, about uh, gay male desire, uh, facing up in the in the late seventies, and then um, male of the species, which I think is in the early nineties. Um, and you know, I think that there, there, we're starting now to write a history of photography 
um, in LGBTQ life. And, uh, you know, there's a very long history go going way back to the beginning of the medium. And yet I think it's safe to say that at the late 70s, there were not a lot of people making artistic photographs about gay male desire. And you were. And yeah. at that same moment, Maplethorpe is, is making some of his most seminal work um, and really at the beginning of his mature career. Yeah. Uh, so I wondered if you could talk about that um, because I feel like you're a very important figure in that history. You made, um, uh, you made work that I think still today uh, is really fresh. Um, it doesn't seem even remotely dated, which I think is uh, actually not true of all the photography from that period in the, in the gay community. Uh, and, and I wondered if you can talk about that, how, how it is you feel that work holds up and also why did you start making that work in the first place? And what was your audience for that work? Um, well, actually, we've working with Jim Gantz, who's the curator from the Getty, and uh, we've kind of rediscovered an earlier series that I did in 1968 oh, called, wow. the, called The Ramble, where in Central Park, I photographed gay men cruising and did some extraordinary portraits, mm. just, you know, perhaps a few dozen rolls of film. And... Uh, and in a way, uh, that kind of became one of the earliest, in a sense, recordings of that gay culture, gay cruising culture right, right. of the time. But, uh, you know, uh, my homoerotic fantasy series uh, sort of grew out of theater of the mind, you know, for Theater of the Mind, I did two interesting photos. Um, one called Bob Leap with Sheep. Right. A man, it's kind right. of a fantasy. An amazing picture. <laughs> and also another one called Hermaphrodite between Venus and Mercury. Those were my first male nudes. You know, I, At that time, I, I was kind of a little embarrassed even to ask someone to take off their T-shirt. Right. But, uh, and, you know, I think gay photographers of my generation. Most of us were still in the closet in a way. Uh, and at some point I realized that I needed to deal with my own sexuality and, and but doing it in a kind of very Tressian way, you know, looking for Jungian archetypes and, and, right. and, and I had a whole collection of, of uh, kind of, primitive porn and, but also seeing, uh, I call it phallic fantasy. I wrote, again, I made huge lists. I'd ask people what, you know, what their fantasy sex was, you know, just seeing it as a wonderful manifestation of kind of really inner desires. And then I just, and I had found a abandoned railroad YMCA and that sort of became my studio uh, and uh, um, it was a perfect match for me in a sense because uh, the photographs are certain, they're, certain uh, uh, they're kind of outrageous in a way and yet uh, other gay men collectors, it, it was a point where other photographers like Maplethorpe and you know, Joel Peter Whitkin and even women photographers began doing the male nude as part of the feminist movement. Right. So just around 1980, it just kind of blossomed out around me, this, this whole movement of photographing the male nude, mm. gay experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I have to say that, you know, from that, it, uh, and I, I think I'll make this the last question because I think it's such an important aspect of your work. Um, I think one of the most extraordinary things about, I mean, there, there, there are many, many different things that I think that you, uh, that you, have, uh, that you have done in your life that, have, that remain unique, where we, even looking back at, at the moment that you did them, we see you now as a kind of a prototype figure. And uh, for me, one of the key ones is a, a switch that you made in the early 1980s, which I think 
you know, is critically important. And it was when you started to remove people from your pictures yeah. and focus entirely on still life constructions for a while. And, uh, and you made a, a number of bodies of work, which I've already mentioned. Um, and the most prominent one in this show being, um, being a fish tank sonata where you used still lifes to tell stories. And this is still quite unusual. It's not unprecedented. I mean, going back to Paul Outerbridge, you could see this sort of thing, but, but there is something really unique about the bodies of work that you did around um, still lifes. And, you know, um, and, and it's quite different, say, from somebody like David Leventhal or Louis Simmons, who were using, um, you know, uh, um, characterological figures, like figurines to tell stories. You were doing it with all kinds of random put together elements that's, uh, that were funny even to look at, or that were, um, that were things you might not see together. And therefore they created, uh, they created storylines just by their juxtaposition. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about why you made that switch and how you ended up finding such a fruitful vein for storytelling narrative and expression, artistic expression, simply by making that decision? Well, it was interesting. You know, it, it came about around 1980, and I had been photographing the male nude for about three or four years. And I just found I was just repeating the same kind of images. Mm. And then uh, I said, well, stop. I'm not gonna photograph. I don't need to photograph people anymore and their psychodramas. I've, I've already said that, you know, and, and just, you know, in this railroad YMCA, there were uh, lots of things left over from the uh, business office of running the railroad. There were desks and old chairs. And I began just bringing in props and setting up little altars in this old building with beautiful light coming in through the windows. And then uh, I just said, well, this is a whole new world. You, can, you know, I could create robots and automatons and all kinds of figures. I could still be doing humans, but sort of make them together out of junk sculpture, like you might see at a roadside attraction. And then uh, I did that in black and white. And of course, 80s, the 80s were the big explosion of color. Right. All the photographers and galleries and museums, and even technologically, it was becoming better and easier to print good archival color with Cibachrome. Mm. And uh, I began shooting the still lifes in black and white and color. And then I said, well, Let's take it outdoors. You know, how do I move all these objects outdoors? And uh, I set up a still life outdoors. And I said, well, it just gets lost in the background, in the environment. And then I said, well, what if I put them in an aquarium and fill it with, I mean, that's, you know, it says inspiration one day and then fill it with water, put it on a little stand and get a wide angle lens. <laughs> And you know, I traveled around America for three years with this fish tank. I mean, I went to Maine and New Mexico, you know, taking it on airplanes on the subway. I was really, <laughs> and filling a different, it was probably the most fun project. But again, it does tell the ecological story of a fisherman who learns to be a ecologically concerned fisherman at the end of the story. Mm. But, uh, also, you know, I did in, encounter Dwayne Michaels, who became, he was eight years older than I am. Mm -hmm. And I'd show him my work every month. And he really felt the photographer should get be into writing, mm -hmm. you know, to define. So, you know, each of the fish tank pictures has a poem with it. You know, right. it's, it's a hundred, it's a narrative. It's like the, the odyssey, <laughs> it's an amazing thing. And they're very simple, you know. Uh, and uh, another aspect of my work is, you know, one always has to do something to earn a living. I could sell prints, but 
And so through doing the still life work, I got into doing mystery book covers for all the, uh, with little knives and guns and nooses. And uh, so I did dozens and dozens of, for Penguin. And so it opened up also a commercial venues for me that wow. was quite useful. You know, I always, but again, with Fish Tank, it was my interest in, in mythical dreamlike journeys. And, and uh, so uh, another aspect of that photography was, uh, you know, New York, we do have winters time. <laughs> and so I, I had a little, I had a very small apartment, studio apartment that Jim Gantz at the Getty was very impressed that I stayed there for 30 years. It was 450 square feet. Wow. That's a beautiful picture window overlooking Riverside Drive. But at the same time, I just began making still lifes on a table, sometimes with artificial life. And there's a whole tradition from the 1930s and 1940s of amateur and professional tabletop photography. Uh, it was done for camera clubs, etc. So uh, one day I just set up near the window a toy, an old toy theater, and put a teapot on the theater. And it's in the tradition of Magritte, and you know very much. And it, it was out of scale. And I, I said, "That's fabulous! You know, it looks wonderful." And then. You know, a year later, that became Teapot Opera. I made the, a narrative in three acts about that. And it led to other uh, tabletop still lives, mm. dealing with things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we did miss you. Do you want to talk about the pointers? Oh, we could certainly talk about the pointers. Yeah. It didn't fit I, into any of those questions, but we certainly well, could. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's as uh, part of my journey after 2000 to kind of just go into new areas, I was just to see what I could do with the camera. I began spinning the camera mm -hmm. at the end of my hand. And, and then I began exploring different shapes. I did, I did a, uh, a whole series of pictures called planets, which are round photos and uh, of just ordinary objects, but they kind of transform just by just by flipping over my lens shade, which made a kind of rough round shape and shooting things. Mm. And that kind of segued. I just thought one day, here's the square. Why not do this? And who said, you know, I, I, I think cameras take round photos or something, the lens. Why not do it this way? And it just opened up a whole new world because the diamond shape, well, it cuts things off in a very interesting way so that they carry on behind the edge of the frame. But also it pushes the energy of the image towards the corners. Mm -hmm. In most photographs, the corners are always neglected. Right. But right. now I consciously push the energy and you kind of get a vertical energy, almost like a, a Japanese scroll or hanging scroll. Yeah. And um, so I did one project, which is partially in the show called uh, Moro Rock, which is a right. py giant pyramid shaped um, rock in Big Sur in Moro Bay. Right. That kind of fit that format. And more recently, I've been doing uh, Silicon Valley Bay Area architecture in a kind of Russian constructivist way. Mm. So using, in effect, the, the shape and the, the way of looking to yeah. look at details in the world. Yes. And again, here's just the detail of a kind of yeah. neighborhood house. And it becomes faceted, you know. There's, there's a play of light and shades and little bits and pieces. So the photograph 
is able to breathe in and out. And it's, it's kind of unique. It's just, just by that simple device, you know, maybe right. delusional. <laughs> you know, many artists are about what they're doing, but. Uh, I don't think, I mean, you know, it connects to me to what you said earlier about how as you get older and you've noticed this in other photographers late in life, that there becomes more of a tendency to, to, uh, to simply accept what is in front of you and think more about your vision of it and how you yeah. see it. Um, and I think that expresses that perfectly. And it's, um, and for me, it was fascinating to see that work and try to think about how the pointers connect to these other passages in your career. Where you're, where you're evoking dream states or where you're setting up oh. lives and the narratives. And somehow it does very much seem like a continuum uh, to me. Yes, you do. As you get older, you, you do become, uh, I guess the world word is uh, transient, mm. flux. You know, I, you know, I lived in Big Sur for 30 years and I just see. me and the rocks and the seals and the seagulls. <laughs> so... Uh, there's something a little solitary about my personality. Mm. Uh, that, uh, but uh, it's still an interesting process, I think. Yeah. I'm still ambulatory, as I say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, th thank you very much, Arthur, for going into that history because I've always, um, as the years have passed since I worked with you, I have always marveled by the hold that those pictures retain on my imagination. Okay. And, uh, and how absolutely different they are from anything that I have seen even since you made them, which I think is quite wonderful. Um, I, I feel very, very pleased that these pictures are being shown in Toronto. Uh, and I wanna thank you very much for, uh, for uh, bringing them to us because I just think it's great for our audience to discover your work. Uh, and on that note, I'll finish things up and thank Stephen Bolger Gallery for giving us the chance to have this conversation.